Every nation has symbols of national pride. The Eiffel Tower, the Washington Monument, the pyramids. Anything happening to one such symbol would be a national disaster. Imagine you're at war though, and a major symbol of your military might was taken or destroyed by the enemy, because that's what happened this week. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, the British and French navies tried to force their way through the Dardanelles to Istanbul, the Ottoman capital, and make an end around and win the war in spite of the deadlock on the Western Front. The Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army launched a third winter offensive against the Russians in the mountains, while further north, the Russians were holding their own against the Germans in Poland. That was last week. A lot of the action this week on the Western Front was in the skies as the war in the air continued to heat up. On March 22nd, two Zeppelins bombed Paris, and the following day, the Germans once again bombed Rheims. The French got a bit of their own back on the 26th when six French airmen bombed Metz. There was, of course, continued action on the ground as men died daily, even without a specific battle or offensive being officially named. See, that was how the stalemate on the Western Front worked, but the thinking behind the war in the West was actually going through some major changes. Okay, last week saw the end of the Champagne Offensive, a three-month series of attacks by the French on small strategic targets held by the Germans. Now, I mentioned that the tactics employed by the French in that offensive were quite different from those used more recently by the British at the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle. So I'll talk a little bit about Western Front strategy for a minute. British General Douglas Haig wasn't a big fan of the French style of attack, pursued throughout the winter by French General Joseph Joffre. Haig figured that, sure, by concentrating on a narrow front, as the French did, artillery might penetrate deeper, but attackers might be enfiladed from the sides, and concentrated artillery bursts on specific small targets forfeited any element of surprise. Haig believed fronts should be large and with wider and longer bombardments, which he first tried at Neuve-Chapelle, where the British really did surprise the Germans. But Neuve-Chapelle highlighted that the biggest problem of all was the lack of real-time communication during battles. Infantry in fixed positions could bury telephone wire towards rear command posts, no problem, and it was safe. But what happened when they advanced? Well, they lost contact, and laying new wire was dangerous in the heat of battle and was often cut anyhow. Wireless radio was still too heavy to really be portable. Pigeons were great at times, but they didn't like to fly on damp days with no wind, which was a lot of days on the Western Front. Dogs, rockets, flags were all used and all had pros and cons, but the main means of communication was human runners. And more often than not, by the time they got their messages through, they were old news. So now, in modern warfare, generals really didn't have that much to do with the decision making in the heat of battle. There was no Napoleon on a hill with a spyglass directing his armies. Now, you had massive armies that were heavily dispersed to confound artillery. So the battlefield was much, much bigger, but looked empty. And the generals were way behind the lines, sitting at desks, looking at loads of maps. The Germans dealt with this by issuing general directives and not detailed orders from the high command and specific commands were only given down at the front. The British officers though, many of them survivors of colonial wars, were used to smaller armies and hands-on direction. And consequently, many more of them died in battle throughout the war by trying to conduct the battles themselves in detail near the front. They found it very hard to accept that crucial decisions were being taken at low levels of authority. But the theory and practice of war was now changing every month and it was a real case of adapt or die. And most armies proved very capable of adapting. For example, early in the war, modern heavy artillery had proven an overwhelming match for the great military fortresses of Europe, as they had all fallen very quickly. And so armies now relied much more on heavy artillery and left the fortresses. There was, though, one fortress that had managed to hold out since the fall of 1914, partially because of difficult terrain and partially because the enemy lacked the necessary big guns. And that fortress is the headline story this week. On March 23rd, 1915, the fortress of Przemysl capitulated to the Russians during a terrible blizzard in which hundreds of men froze to death. The fortress yielded 126 
1,000 prisoners and 700 big guns to Russia, and also gave three Russian army corps the chance to finally turn around, leave the fortress, and fight the Austrians and Germans in the field. Now that's a lot of extra troops suddenly joining the battle. Russian General Ivanov was preparing to make a huge push to clear the mountains and invade Hungary. Something that seems truly incredible though, the Austrian Second Army Command was not informed of the surrender of the fortress. So a few days later, a completely pointless Austrian offensive was launched. This also had no chance of success and would result in thousands more Habsburg casualties. Here's the thing though, Przemysl had by this time come to symbolize Austro-Hungarian military prestige, right? So Austrian Army Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf had allowed its liberation to totally distort his entire Eastern Front strategy to the point that his whole army was nearly annihilated. The winter campaign by the Imperial Army in the snows and the mountains cost 800,000 casualties in an attempt to liberate fewer than 130,000 troops. There was very, very little to show for their sacrifice. Conrad's flawed planning and execution furthermore resulted in the German military having greater and greater control over the entire Habsburg command structure. This might have been a humiliation, but for survival it could only be a good thing considering the continuing Austrian military failures. So the Russians now began a counteroffensive and pounded the Austrians throughout the week. And as they took the Lipkow Pass, they took 5,700 Austrian prisoners the 25th, and another 2,500 the 26th, over 10,000 total for the week, in addition to those from Przemysl. Although the war was a blight for everyone, things looked especially bleak for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. On a related note, the Italian military attaché left Vienna this week. Now, why is that related? Well, Italy was still neutral so far in the war, having refused to join the Central Powers when war broke out, even though she had an alliance with them. But Italy had several land issues with Austria, alliance or no. And with the empire now facing military destruction, perhaps this was a good time to stake her claim to disputed lands. Whatever the case, the attaché leaving Vienna cannot bode well for the empire. And at the end of the week, though very little has changed, everything has. The stalemate continued in the West, but future battles would look very different from the past ones. The Russians and Germans continued their game of back and forth in Poland, and even in the far north, where the port of Memel had changed hands from German to Russia and back to German within the past week. But that one major milestone, the capitulation of Przemysl, was a major change. 133 days. That's how long the Austro-Hungarian garrison held out in the second siege of Przemysl, which is pretty impressive, especially when you consider the size of the army. The world's first airmail, actually, was flown out of Przemysl during the siege, mostly military mail, but not entirely. Now that's an interesting piece of knowledge, but it tells nothing of the real story. The story of a fortress that was supposed to hold 50,000 men, but crammed in over twice that. Men who lived on horse meat for months in abysmal conditions, awaiting relief that never came as offensive after offensive came to disaster in the frozen mountains because the Austrian commanders were in every way unprepared for winter war. Heck, unprepared for war in general. First, they were humiliated by little Serbia and now crushed by Russia. The mood in the empire was despair. Whole military units even deserted to the enemy and the casualty toll for the empire's war was in the millions. I say the empire's war for it was indeed the Austro-Hungarian Empire who actually pulled the trigger and there was no question that the empire had wanted war. Well, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. Was that the final time that I'm going to mention Przemysl? No spoilers! But what do you think about the Austro-Hungarian army at this point? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to find out how the whole situation in Przemysl started, check out our episode from week 9 right here, because that's when it all started. And for our mobile viewers, you should see a link to that episode right here in the top right corner. Patrick Harris from Toronto, Canada is our Patreon supporter of the week. Hooray, Patrick Harris! You can check out our Patreon campaign if you want to support our show financially. And if you liked what you saw, please subscribe. See you next time.